Hi, I'm Liz Whiteacre, and today we'll talk about how audience matters in professional writing. This week, we're thinking about how tone and voice work in blogging and how that's a little bit different than the academic research that you're going to be doing in your different courses or journalistic writing, which you've been exposed to in a variety of different periodicals and books in the past. We'll also think about blog navigation techniques and what you can do for your audience to make life a little bit easier when they are reading your blogs and also the Creative Commons licenses and how you can make sure that you are collecting graphics that are available for you to use uh, so you can proceed plagiarism free. And we'll also talk about how you can use a variety of blog attribution strategies to make sure that you're letting your readers know where the information and graphics are coming from in your blog when you're borrowing them from other people. So let's start off with voice and tone. When you visit a blog, maybe you find it via social media, maybe someone sends it to you, or perhaps you are doing that pre-research that we talked about in our uh, textbook, thinking about a little bit of information seeking to help you figure out where you're at and maybe what direction you wanna head in. That's different from heading into the library databases, which we will experience very soon, and looking at academic journal articles that are peer reviewed. And that's certainly different than uh, coming across one of your favorite news sources here in the picture, for example, New York Times, and reading a report on what's happening in our world today. We go to these three different types of resources for different reasons. Sometimes we go to all three of them when we're investigating something, for example, a class project, um, but also just in our daily lives. We go to all three types of writing uh, because they're professional. We can get, if we're paying attention to our source, uh, source the selection criteria, we can get great information from all of them. But the way information is presented to us is a little bit different. In all of these, we are going to be getting articles, things that are a little bit shorter. When we go to a blog, we expect that the person who's written it will be presenting us information uh, via their personal experience that they'd like to know uh, that we're able to appreciate. So they will incorporate personal anecdotes, they'll incorporate evidence from other sources and let you know how they're doing that through a variety of strategies. In an academic audience, we're looking at those journal articles because they're often much more in depth, right? A researcher blogging about their personal experiences in the kitchen, it's going to be a little bit different than about their cancer research. Uh, could be either one in that case, right? Uh, but when we're looking at the research that they're conducting, perhaps in a lab with other scientists, we're expecting different information and how they report that particular finding to us. We also sometimes stress academic uh, periodicals a little bit more because they go through what's called a peer review process. And we'll talk about this more later in the term when we're doing our research projects, but it's more than just submitting an article to the journal. Um, in the picture here, we can clearly see the American Educational Research Journal. If I've written an article, I, I give it to their editors and then they send it out to other educators in the field who read it and comment on it and decide whether or not it's credible enough, if there are any issues they'd like to see addressed before it's published. When I am working on a personal blog, I don't need to go through that kind of um, peer review process. I can just hit WordPress, type up what I want to say, and publish it, and it is out there in the world. The journalistic audience, when I'm kind of coming to a newspaper or a magazine that has um, given me an expectation that they're going to be reporting on, you know, what's happening, what's happening with uh, wildflowers 
wild uh, flowers, I guess. <laughs> or in the, I was thinking about the uh, wildfires out on the West Coast right now. What's happening with the COVID-19 pandemic? What's going on with um, the election this year? What's happening with uh, the different riots that have been happening. If I want to make sure that I'm being informed, I will check my news source. And then I'll also think about um, the reporting that the journalist is doing, right? They're usually focusing on those five W's, who, what, where, when, how, and why. And there's not as much editorializing uh, that I would necessarily get in a blog if I wanted to read about someone's interpretation of why something's happening or maybe what the effects of something happening are on the wider society or on a particular thing. So as an audience member, I'm coming to these different types of uh, sources for different reasons. And oftentimes, me personally, I'm going to all three different kinds so that I'm getting a variety of perspectives on a particular situation. Now, the tone and the voice that all of these things are written in are really distinct, very different from each other. Usually in uh, the journalistic and academic articles, we see third person being used. Very rarely is there the personal commentary, unless maybe you're in an editorial section, or perhaps there is a note where the researchers are commenting on the research they did, that you might see first person I or we being used, but usually it's much more formal. Um, the writers of those pieces are trying to let us know, this is what happened, this is you know what you need to know about these situations, and there isn't a lot of, uh, qualifications necessarily where I think I feel as the writer. Whereas in the blog, uh, that's usually written in first person. I am sharing my personal experience, I'm sharing my understanding of things with you, and I'm using first person to do so. And often there is that conversational use of second person, the uh, direct address to readers, where you'll see a blog writer say something like, you can do this in your kitchen too. Here are the steps you need to follow in order to make this particular casserole. So there are different perspectives that pieces are being written in, uh, different levels of conversational uh, feeling that's happening with the audience, whether or not they are being engaged directly in the discussion by the use of second person. I would say that in all three of these categories, writers are trying to be very professional. They are reviewing their work, they are spending time revising it, they're proofreading their work carefully before they put it out there so that their credibility is enhanced and we trust them more as kind of purveyors of important information that we need to know and think about in our daily lives. So across the board, all writers are trying to be as professional as possible, but how they're choosing to share their ideas is going to change depending on the situation. When you're thinking about writing your blog posts this term for whatever blog you choose to develop, let's go back to that idea of recipes. Perhaps you want to share uh, some experiences in the kitchen that you've been uh, undertaking recently and you'd like to share that exploration, share what you've learned, provide tips perhaps to other people who are also interested in making those delicious things you're going to wanna to make sure that your audience focused. And by that I mean you're writing for someone else. You're not just sharing like you might in a diary what's happened to you. So in the, the blog project, we definitely have an awareness of audience. And as we started to think about uh, target audience and secondary audience or primary and secondary audiences, you can be very specific. You definitely, if you're writing that recipe blog, would want to talk to people who are interested in <laughs> making recipes. Uh, your work isn't going to be as hard if people come to your blog with the expectation that they're going to learn something from you that they can put to practice in their own kitchen and give your recipe a try. You don't have to try and convince someone who 
does not like cooking or eating or being in the kitchen to try and follow along with you, that would be probably someone in your tertiary audience who just stumble across the site. You'll definitely want to be conversational. Uh, in your blog this term, I recommend using first person to establish your expertise and share what you think and feel and observe, uh, suggest in your blog post to your audience. And if you would like, you could try out second person and talk directly to the people who you're writing to. Or if you want, you might use third person and put your examples in. Um, in that vein, for example, I might say something like, I have tried this muffin recipe many, many times, and those of you who enjoy baking might also like it too. Versus if I was using second person, I have tried this many times, and I think you are going to enjoy making these muffins too. You also want to think about an invitation to return. When you're blogging, you are making a commitment um, well, in this class, you're making a commitment to the course in order to post a certain number of times. Uh, but if you choose to continue blocking after the class, you're making a commitment to post content fairly regularly. It might be once a month. It might be weekly. Whew. It's going to be a lot of work to do it daily, but you certainly can give that a try. And so you're thinking about providing an invitation to return. You might be self-referential. You might talk about what you posted last time, which would encourage your reader to go back and look at a past link. And towards the end, you might talk about, well, hey, next time we're going to be covering this topic, which would invite them to come back in future or maybe sign up for your mailing list so that they don't miss any posts. And finally, you definitely want to be professional in your blog this term. This can be an excellent uh, writing sample that you're developing that can be used in a variety of ways after the class, from applying to internships, scholarships, jobs. So give it your all. You can use evidence that's anecdotal and also research-based. So you can go out and find other sources that back up what you have to say or provide helpful data or illustrations. Um, they might also uh, provide other points of view other than your own that you can address. And anecdotal, and by that we're thinking about little stories. This happened to me, this one little thing, and now let me talk about that. Or sharing a story of maybe what happened to your neighbor, or what happened to your dog in your post. That can also serve as evidence too. And then we'll also want to think about connecting to larger conversations. For the blogs in this class, I'm asking you to include at least two outside resources. And part of that is to practice <laughs> source integration, summary, um, excerpting small quotes, practice attribution. But it's also a way for you to make sure that what you're talking about in your blog is connected to that wider conversation happening out there. If you can say, hey, these people are talking about this and it connects to what I'm talking about in this way, right? You're, you're kind of widening the net for your readers and introducing them to other people's ideas and blogs and uh, sources that they can go on and continue that journey of learning and exploration beyond your one post. When you're thinking about your blog, it's important to consider navigation techniques early on. Using clear and concise titles can be really helpful. While you start up your blog, you are thinking about two to begin with, um, your home page and your about page. When we see home, we know that that is the place that is the, the home base to borrow from baseball, right? That's the, the hub where all of the other pages on the site are going to come off of. On the about, we have an association with that, that that's going to give information about the blog or maybe about the author or the organization. You can certainly be a little bit more specific there. You could say about the author, about the blog. Um, more information, that might, that might be a little uh, less clear. But you'll also want to think about the titles that you're using for your posts. If you look at the blog development site that I've created here, I took a snapshot of the homepage. You can follow the link uh, in our LMS under the resources tab if you want to go in and check it out and read the articles. They're actually about 
doing things for the blogs in this class. So there's some helpful tips in there. And they also model what a sample post would look like. We also have different examples of blogs former students have made. Uh, they've given their permission to share with you, so you can check out what uh, they've chosen to do in WordPress on all of the different blogs that they've created and the different types of topics and posts and et cetera that they have uh, explored over the years. So here down at the bottom, I have navigating source material, right? blogging, getting started, source attribution. I'm trying to be clear in my title what the post is going to be about. I don't want to use a title like blog post one, blog post two. The posts are already going to be posted in order, right? Reverse time order. So if I scroll down to the bottom of all of your blogs, I'll be able to start with the very first post you've ever made and work my way up. I already know that it's going to be a blog post because I have come to your blog and that's my expectation. So making sure that you are picking a title that lets your readers know what the content is going to be about can be really helpful. Mine are pretty short just because that's something I prefer when I'm navigating blogs, but you could certainly come up with a different way to title uh, your your different posts. Some people like to do questions. Some people like to kind of create a thematic way to title and that's just fine. But make sure it's clear what people are about to click on and it will really help them out. You can also use different kinds of toolbars. If you notice in the screenshot example, the toolbar for this website appears at the very top of the page. We have home, about, contact, and blog. Those are the basics. Okay. Uh, sometimes students choose to add on to that. They like to create a resources page, and that might be another tab. Um, sometimes people like to include a gallery of uh, photographs or YouTube videos, depending on what their topic is. That might be something that's a focus for them, and so they'd like to kind of have a place for uh, their audience to come and, and kind of see and engage with those things apart from the articles that they are posting on those particular topics. That's all extra bells and whistles, and so that's something that you can make a decision whether or not you would like to include. Another place that you will see toolbars is down at the very bottom of the page and along the side of the page in the sidebar. It's up to you how you would like to present your toolbar. It's just important to me that you have at least one <laughs> so that your readers and I can navigate your website. You can also think about layers. Sometimes people would like to include um, kind of multi layers with their toolbars where I might hover over, if I take my thing, I might hover over about and it might come down to a sub menu that has about the author, about this topic, about the, the project. And that's something that you could explore and, and consider as well. Um, when you're thinking about layers, you're thinking about how many um, steps in are you asking readers to take from your home page and here is a link right here that you can uh, click on in the slides that are posted on the resources page it provides a bunch of other different examples visual aids of different types of toolbars and how they're set up and some different ways to think about your site organization which i hope you'll check out after the the lecture Another thing we'll think about this week is the Creative Commons. This is important because as you go out and get information, it's really easy to remember to include attribution for print sources. When I go out and I find a website or I find a song or I find a video, if I find a graphic, if I find a photograph, all of those things need to have attribution, um, some sort of way of citing that material for your readers so that they know that it has been created by someone other than you. It can make your job a lot easier when you're thinking about visual aids if you start your search looking at graphics that have various Creative Commons license. When 
things started to get very, very digital in the 90s. Um, Creative Commons was established as a way for uh, artists, photographers, musicians, um, and even uh, writers to be able to give their creative work a label so that people would know what's okay with them um, in terms of sharing their work. So if you see this graphic here, I've provided a few of the uh, very popular ones. If you've noticed in my slideshows, I have been including the CC license there. I have been uh, choosing to incorporate quite a few graphics from PowerPoint itself. And when I go into photos, online photos, I make sure the little box is checked that says only search CC images. Now that means as PowerPoint presents me things, all of the different options for clip art, photographs, illustrations are ones that the people who created it have said I'm allowed to share. There are various um, kind of levels for here you can see attribution, you have to give me credit. So if you're gonna use my photograph of a hummingbird, you need to say Liz Whiteacre took it. Other people, they don't, they don't mind. And if you notice down here, this photo is by an unknown author. So sometimes people will put things up on the web for people to share and they don't wanna have any credit. So it's good that we know that, right? It's good that we know that. Um, some people will say, hey, please don't use this for commercial use. Don't make money on it. And so you know that that image you have found would be great for your PowerPoint that you're doing for your speech class but not so great for the flyer you're creating for your RSO that's going to be charging money for an event, right? Uh, in our textbook, you're gonna be learning a lot more about the different license and what they mean and how you can navigate that process when you select things to use in your own projects. But it's important to pay attention and know about these things because it really helps you be st uh, stress-free. Um, the permission to use is very clear. The way you can use it is very clear. And the type of attribution that you need to provide is very clear. Most Creative Commons search engines, um, for example, the, the, the PowerPoint does it. Um, oh. What are some funds here? Uh, Visual Hunt, Flickr, Wikimedia Commons. Um, those are all different things that people have provided uh, attributions in. They often give you a little uh, caption that you can put directly under what you're borrowing and it makes it super easy. You can also participate by sharing your own work through Wikimedia, Visual Hunt, Flickr. There are also some for um, musical compositions if you wanna include a soundtrack, for example, with a presentation that you're doing. Um, or if you create music, you can let people know how they can use your music for different videos and jingles, those sorts of things. So we have <laughs> making sure that we are getting our uh, visual aids, our graphics, and we're also thinking about any YouTube videos, podcasts, uh, resources that we're finding on the internet, books we're pulling in, all of those things need to be cited in some way. Uh, a couple other strategies that you can use to help your readers know what's going on in your work are listed here. We can create in-text attributions through naming sources in sentences, just like we do when we're practicing our MLA uh, style in our academic uh, writing. You can also hyperlink sources, which is really helpful to readers, because if I see something very interesting that you summarized or quoted, it gives me an opportunity to click on that and go follow and read it and come back so I have that context or click on it, open it up in another tab so that I'm able to come back and learn more about it later. You can also provide kind of additional URLs or citations or resources links at the bottom of your blog. That can be a helpful place for readers to go in order to be able to follow up on sources that you shared. And certainly in captions, if you are providing um, a graphic, if you are embedding a video or a podcast, you can provide that attribution directly underneath uh, through a caption box. Let's take a look at some examples of those. 
through um, different students' blogs. And these are all blogs that you can find in the Student Work Gallery in our classes site. And if you pull up the slideshow later on, you can follow the links on the slides as well to check out the full logs. So this is an example of in-text attribution. Uh, this is from Michaela's blog, Something Fishy. Her whole blog was themed around, so you want to get a fish tank, and she provides advice to people on how to get started, how to maintain, ways to get involved with the, the fish keeping community. I definitely recommend that you check it out. She is addressing college students who are interested in getting started. So here, when we look at her paragraph, you'll notice right away visually, we have three hyperlinks here. Even though she's providing the hyperlink to the source, she's also mentioning what those sources are in her sentences. Have you ever wondered why you see fish tanks in dentists and doctors' offices? Most of the movie Finding Nemo takes place in a dentist fish tank, but why are they commonly there? Well, fish tanks have been known to, quote, reduce blood pressure and emotional agitation, end quote, according to Alan N. Schwartz, PhD. There was once an experiment performed by Deborah Cracknell, a professor at Plymouth University, about the psychological effects of aquariums. So now I'm not going to read the whole paragraph, but it's really clear here to me as a reader, not only where is the information coming from that Michaela is including in her blog, Right, but she's also providing a little of information about the sources. So I know that um, Schwartz is a PhD or a doctor. Um, I know that Cracknell is a professor is a professor at a well-known university. So by providing a little bit of information about the source, she's heightening her level of credibility. She's letting me know where the information is coming from, how it's being integrated into her paragraph, and she even has those hyperlinks so that I could follow up and go check out those sources myself. Great example for something you can do in your blog. You can also hyperlink to sources. So here, Ali's blog, um, her blog was all about binging Netflix, and so she talked about different movies she felt other people should not miss, different movies that she was experiencing in the moment. Um, and in here, she is talking about um, the movie Mean Girls. As you come down into the blog, right, Ellie chose to hyperlink part of a sentence that says, explained in this blog, right, that would send people there. And then down at the bottom, she lists the names of the blogs that she's referring to um, throughout the piece. So that way, if this hyperlink doesn't work for some reason, then I can still find out the name of it and find it on my own. So that is important that you make sure that you have those two key pieces of information so that your readers can always find where you got the information from. And so that's another way to do it, rather than necessarily just taking the name of the source. Um, you could do it that way too. You can provide that um, additional uh, resources, links, and sources down at the bottom of the page. Sometimes hyperlinks don't work, and so having the full URL or having the information about the source can be really helpful. Here's an example of two different styles. We have one that looks a lot like um, MLA. <laughs> You're, you're welcome to use MLA if that's something that you're comfortable with, but you do not have to. And then on the other side of the page, we have uh, the URLs listed that you could click on and go to those sites, or you could copy and paste into a new browser. Um, these are from Hannah Christopher's blog, The Benefits of Dance, and Shidema Offer's blog, Knickknacks. And you can check those out in the Student Work Gallery and learn more about why you should be dancing and knitting not necessarily at the same time. And then captions are also important. You've noticed in a couple of the posts that have had pictures that the students have included caption information. Um, here, Connor Steve's blog on weightlifting 101, he was uh, making a post on the importance of nutrition while you are weight training. And if you notice here this picture of the meal, he has his photo credit. He lets you know who it is 
It's from Visual Hunt, and he provided the Creative Commons license information. Now, he didn't just know that. When he went to Visual Hunt and found this picture, Visual Hunt told him, hey, this is the kind of credit you need to put in your caption. So I do recommend as you get started with this project to check out Visual Hunt. It's a wonderful way to search for various uh, graphics. They have a ton of stuff and everything that's in that particular search engine, they are all Creative Commons at various degrees. Whereas Flickr, which is very popular, will also have copyrighted material that you cannot borrow um, and you cannot download and use. Um, Google, you can go into advanced settings and ask it to search for Creative Commons, but you have to take those extra steps. So um, definitely check out Visual Hunt. I think you'll really enjoy it. Looking ahead, we are working on our blogs um, and we're going to start getting some feedback on our proposals and think about what's happening with our research project as well. Again, we're toggling back and forth between our blog audience and our academic audience to allow a little bit of time uh, for the, the closed door philosophy um, projects to sit and, and, and steep so that you can come back to them and continue working on them with a little bit of space, um, but also so that you are practicing those critical thinking, critical reading muscles, that you are able to analyze the rhetorical situation and think, okay, here's my audience, this is my message, what do I need to do in this situation to make sure that I am really effectively reaching out to the people I want to reach out to. So when I'm doing that in my blog, I'm going to need to use these particular strategies. And whew, when I come back over to my formal research paper, I need to use these strategies. And you're going to find that a lot of them are the same. And you'll also find that there are some moments where using a very specific technique for a specific reason to a specific group of people will be amazingly effective. So we're practicing those toggling skills and also our troubleshooting skills. If there are things you don't know how to do, figure it out, right? Contact me in messages and let me know if you have questions. Reach out to your classmates. We've got that questions about bulletin board on the forums page. You can um, say, hey, is anybody else trying to find this or is anybody else struggling with this? Making sure to hit Google, doing tutorials, seeing if other people have how-to materials that will help you out. So part of the process is figuring out how do I need to do this and Strengthening that skill this term as well is going to give you an amazing arsenal of uh, techniques that you can use in all of your future classes, future careers, etc. I can't wait to see what you create and again get in touch if you have any questions.